Hi, I'm, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is James Monroe, Part 3. We stopped last time. Uh, the War of 1812 has started. We stopped in 1812. And during that war, which lasted about, uh, well, into early 1815, uh, there were plenty of victories and defeats. And one of the early defeats was the fall of Detroit, which was very traumatic. And after that, the uh, British and American Indians took Illinois and Indiana. And the, the folks in Ohio and Kentucky, the settlers there, were ready to fight. So it was, it was, it was a scary time for people in those areas. There were victories in, Ameri in, in 1813 for the U.S. In, uh, the U.S. captured York, which later was renamed Toronto in Canada. Also, victories at Fort Niagara and Fort Erie. Major victory on, on Lake Erie on the water, the U.S. Navy, under the command of Oliver, uh, uh, Admiral Ol Oliver Perry, defeated the British uh, near, put, near South Bass Island and uh, Putten Bay in western Lake Erie, and that gave the United States control of the Great Lakes. Another major victory was in Canada, in Ontario, not too far from Detroit, uh, across the, uh, uh, by the Thames River, in Detroit, in, in, in Ontario, and uh, the British and Indians were defeated by the U.S. forces. And at that battle, Tecumseh was, was killed. And so Tecumseh, Tecumseh was a great man, but um, he, his interests were in opposition to those of the United States. So people were pretty happy that he died, at least Americans were, because this meant the, the weakening and really the end of his dream of, of, of confeding, creating a confederation of American Indian nations to stop American expansion west. So as a result of all these things, the United States regained control of Illinois and Indiana. But the, uh, there was still more uh, trouble with American Indians who had been inspired by Tecumseh. Uh, Creek Indians uh, attacked and massacred 250 American settlers near Mobile, Alabama, and they had been inspired by Tecumseh. After that, Andrew Jackson uh, took 2,000 men from the Tennessee militia and marched south, attacking the Creek Indians. In two battles, 1,400 Creek warriors were killed, and Andrew Jackson was promoted and became a major general in the U.S. Army. This was the beginning of his rise to fame and power, Andrew Jackson. And that was a major, that defeat of, of the Creek Indians uh, was, was a major development in creating security in what was then the West, may, allowing Americans to move into, the, into that, to that region east of the Mississippi River. In August of 1814, the, the worst defeat in the war took place when the British marched into Washington, Washington City, our nation's capital, virtually undefended. And they set fire to the, the White House, the Capitol, and other major buildings. So this, this was very traumatic. And it was basically because we had a Secretary of War who was incompetent, John Armstrong. The British only stayed a couple days in Washington, and they, they, they didn't stay long. And then they left. And after the Americans came back into their burned city, the, cities, the, the citizens were cursing President James Madison, some of them blaming him for the destruction of the capital. And he was very depressed. He was shattered and woebegone. And this is when, this is when actually James Monroe, uh, probably the most important time of his life, took place. When he, our, the hour of, our, of a very dark time in American history, after the burning of Washington City, later renamed Washington, D.C., uh, and, of course, we didn't know what was going to happen next. And would the British come back and, and take Washington permanently? Uh, so, uh, uh, and what, what happened is James, President Madison, he needed, he needed help, and he fired John Armstrong. And uh, James Monroe, who was Secretary of State, was also named Secretary of War. And he continued in that role for the rest of the War of 1812. And then he got very, very busy, and he really rallied our country. First of all, rallied the citizens citizens of Washington, D.C., Washington City, to defend Washington from a further attack. He installed new enthusiasm in the American Army. You know, James Monroe was a man of action, and he wasn't so much of an intellectual. In wartime, you really need men of action, and uh, 
James Madison, the president, wasn't so much that. And so James Monroe played a major role. This was really his time to shine, probably the most important time in his life. Historian Harlow Giles Unger, who wrote what I think is the best biography that I've come across of James Monroe, uh, and there, there really is room. You know, there really is a dearth of, uh, of biographies, of really good biographies. There's a couple others that are, so this one by Harry Ammon is pretty detailed. And, uh, but anyway, this is, he wrote a tremendous biography, uh, Harlow Giles Unger, of James Monroe. And he wrote this after, he wrote about uh, Monroe, after the destruction of Washington City in August of 1814, when James Monroe was named Secretary of War. Quote, now in full command, Monroe acted swiftly and deliberately, calling in militia from other states, ordering and distributing supplies and setting up an intelligence system and teams of riders to transmit intelligence to his headquarters. He set up a camp cot to let him sleep on the job, but he never slept on the job. He spent almost 24 hours a day in a frenzy of activity, building up troop strength around Washington and Baltimore, and ordering artillery placements along the Potomac to bolster defenses of the capital. He was everywhere, immersing himself in every detail of the city's defense, all but hauling logs into the breastworks himself. His was an inspiring presence that rallied citizen spirits, bound the best of them as one, to save their city from further assault. Nor did he ignore the rest of the country. He sent a message to General Andrew Jackson, then headquartered in Mobile to take his 1,000-man force to defend New Orleans against attack. He promised Jackson 10,000 additional men, then sent express messages to the governors of Tennessee and Kentucky to send militiamen and volunteers to New Orleans. In messages to the press across the nation, he warned of 12 to 15,000 British troops sailing from Ireland on their way to New Orleans and called on Westerners to defend their rights to the Mississippi River. Across the West, farmers, trappers, woodsmen, hunters, the settlers Monroe had championed in Richmond and Washington, answered his call, streaming over fields and through forests by the dozens at first, then hundreds, then thousands, then nearly 6,000 in all, on foot, on horses and mules, by wagon and by boat, to take their places in New Orleans alongside the Tennessee general they called Old Hickory. Governors also responded to Monroe's call for militiamen. They had known Monroe for years, trusted him. He had met them all somewhere, in the Army, in Congress, in New York or Philadelphia, somewhere, and he had courted their friendships, kept in touch, writing them regularly with warm, with warm words that always ended with his favorite phrase, your friend. With, with the government bankrupt and no central bank from which to borrow, Monroe ignored both the law and the Constitution and seized power, saying he was the government of the United States. He intimidated private banks and municipal corporations into lending him more than $5 million on his own signature. So you can see he was real busy. <laughs> he was really busy. And this was, yeah, that great moment in his life. So after the following month, after the British had uh, destroyed Washington, they turned their attention on Baltimore and they attacked Fort McHenry, which is near Baltimore, and the British were defeated. So all the effort that uh, James Monroe made and Americans made worked, and Baltimore was defended successfully. Uh, one of the witnesses to the British uh, attack on Baltimore was attorney Francis Scott Key, who watched the, quote, rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in air, you know, the, the British bombardment of Fort McHenry, to his, to his amazement, to his amazement in the morning, but the dawn's early light revealed that the American flag was still there. And so this is where we get the Star Spangled Banner, which became our national anthem in 1931. Harlow Giles Unger, the wonderful biography of uh, James Monroe, continues, quote, Convinced us never before of the in inability of an untrained citizen's army to defend the country, Monroe scrapped the Republican principles of his youth and drew up a plan to draft a standing army of 100,000 men. Even as a young man, Monroe had never clung obstinately to any political position if he recognized it to be contrary to the nation's interests. Although he recognized the dangers of a standing army to the nation's liberties under an unscrupulous commander-in-chief, 
he also recognized that there might be no nation unless it was prepared at all times to repel foreign invaders. Only a standing army could provide such a defense. Well, we actually did not uh, develop a uh, you know, big national army at that time, but he was on the right track because you know Great Britain and France were these superpowers. There were issues with American Indians, and the state militias just were not effective. There was this old belief that uh, going back to ancient Greece and Rome that you know citizen soldiers could defend the country. And they were worried that you know they thought, oh, if we have a big national army, we'll be like the Roman Empire. We'll lose our freedom. So after uh, after Baltimore was successfully defended, and uh, we achieved, we, we were able to turn the British back after the devastation of the defeat of Wash at Washington. Uh, meanwhile, anti-war Federalists from Connecticut. Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Vermont met in Hartford, Connecticut, calling for secession. Just imagine, so in the, this federal, the Federalist Party, leaders of the Federalist Party were talking about leaving the Union. Well, meanwhile, we're at war. So this was a very, very tough time. And President Madison needed help. He really needed help. And James Monroe was the guy who helped, the guy who helped him during his hour of need and our nation's hour of need. And then the key battle... The most important battle in the war took place in January of 1815 at New Orleans. The British had this huge force, and they wanted to take New Orleans because it was the key to control the Mississippi River. And all the work that um, James Monroe had done, uh, calling, uh, uh, communicating with Andrew Jackson and lots of people, uh, different state militias, to, and send guys, writing in the newspaper, just individuals were, were going south. And a, a tremendous, amazing, one of the great victories in American his, history took place in, uh, at New Orleans. And Andrew Jackson, the U.S. forces led by Andrew Jackson, defeated the British at New Orleans with very few casualties and lots of, of British casualties. So this was, and this really, uh, this, well, this more than anything else, uh, cemented Andrew Jackson's fame as a national hero. Because it was because uh, the British would have taken, they would have kept New Orleans. It was the colonial era. Around that time, shortly thereafter, actually the peace treaty had been signed uh, in in uh, Ghent, Belgium, but the news had not uh, reached. But sure, about a week after news of the victory at New Orleans, everyone in Washington was waiting to see what would happen. It was very dramatic and a lot of anticipation. People were nervous. And they're very happy that this victory was achieved. And then they got news that the peace treaty had been signed. The war was over. Uh, another thing that happened is William Henry Harrison, his victories over American Indians and Andrew Jackson's led to the purchase of Indian lands east of the Mississippi River. So that, again, that area became safe for settlers. And settlers flooded into the west, the land east of the Mississippi River. Again, Harlow Giles Under continues, quote, Monroe had taken advantage of General William Henry Harrison's victory over the Indian nations of the West to negotiate the purchase of almost all Indian lands east of the Mississippi River, making the Western Territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River safe for American migration. Secure from attack by British troops and Indians, tens of thousands of Americans streamed westward to carve new farms from virgin plains, harvest furs and pelts from superabundant wildlife, cull timber from vast forests, and chisel ore from rich mountainsides. The land rush added six states and scores of towns to the United States, generated wealth for every man, woman, and child in the nation, and engendered the greatest social and economic revolution in history. Never before in the annals of man had a sovereign state transferred so much land to ordinary citizens. Among those five states which joined the Union, uh, 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 five included Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So this was really something, what, what the, the efforts of James Monroe, among others. After the war, um, Monroe was exhausted. You know, he was really, he was dead. You know, he was... He'd been working so hard. He'd been wor working seven days a week for six months. And at one point, he wore the same clothes for 10 days. So he was very, very tired. His wife, Elizabeth, was depressed. His daughter was depressed. depressed. And uh, so he needed rest. He needed R&R &R to, to, to prepare for the next part, part of his life. So by uh, 1816, 
uh, he decided, James Monroe decided to run for president of the United States. And he also started building his uh, a home that he named Oak Hill, 35 miles from Washington, similar to Monticello. Now, in the election, uh, Monroe was the Republican candidate. And again, the, uh, they changed their name to the Democratic Party just a, a few decades later. And the, 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 the Federalist candidate was Rufus King from New York. Uh, Monroe received 183 electoral votes and King 34. So he was elected the fifth president of the United States. And this was the beginning of the end of the Federalist Party because they were, they were discredited. You know, people realized, wow, look at these guys. We're fighting a war for our survival. And the Federalists were plotting to leave the Union. So the Federalist Party was, was, was a dying party at that time. Also in 1816, the American Colonization Society was formed, the purpose of which was to send free African Americans to Africa. And James Monroe was involved in raising the money to purchase land in West Africa, which became the country of Liberia. The capital uh, city, Monrovia, was named after him. So the United States had a colony in Africa, the purpose of which was to send African Americans there. So by 1817, James Monroe was inaugurated as the fifth president in March of 1817, and he had this to say in his, in his inaugural address, quote, Never did a government commence under auspices so favorable, nor ever was success so complete. If we look to the history of other nations, ancient or modern, we find no example of a growth so rapid, so gigantic, of a people so prosperous and happy. In contemplating what we still have to perform, the heart of every citizen must expand with joy when he reflects how near our government has approached to perfection. So he was very, very popular at this time. You know, everybody knew how much he had done. They knew he had served in the American Revolution and fought in many ba battles, not so much as, a, as an officer, but as a regular soldier, risked his life. And in the War of 1812, he played the key role in turning the tide in the dark days after the destruction of Washington City and leading to the, 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 the great victory at New Orleans. He'd helped open the West, and uh, there was economic growth. The economy was growing because the West was safe and people were moving in. And he, he had gray hair, a lined face, face, but he was robust, handsome, and fit. John Quincy Adams was named his Secretary of State from Massachusetts, and his Secretary of War was John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. So they had the regional ballots, north and south. Also in 1817, the Canadian border was demilitarized. So that was really good. We, uh, we, that, that could be a safe... People, people didn't have to worry about attack from either side of the Canadian border. Also in 1817, Mississippi became the 20th state, a slave state. Also, President Monroe had a three-and-a-half-month tour to New England and west to Detroit. He was trying to strengthen popular support for his government. Again, late in 1817, he moved into a rebuilt White House. The White House was finally ready for occupancy after the, it, being, it had been burned in uh, 1814. And Monroe had bought auction possessions from the executed Queen Marie Antoinette in France. Remember before when he was ambassador and he brought a number of these, these, uh, this furniture and so forth into the White House. On that trip west, he spent a fair amount of time in Ohio, and he, he visited places like Sandusky, Delaware, Chillicothe, Zanesville, a total of eight towns in Ohio, as well as Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After the White House was reopened, it had been called the Presidential Mansion, but it was renamed the White House because of the fresh white paint. And the, uh, the motto of his administration was the Era of Good Feelings because there was uh, people were happy about winning the war and uh, everything, things were going well for the United States. However, in 1818, there were severe economic problems, high inflation. The Bank of the United States was in trouble and danger, it was in danger of going under. It had illegally made, failed to make specie payments. There was a contraction. It curtailed loans and, contra and uh, contracted credit. The result was the first economic and financial depression in our, for our country, the Panic of 1819. December of 1818, Illinois became the 21st state, a free state, 
and Alabama became the 22nd state, a slave state. So this was this is how it went. You know, they were trying to keep a balance. Actually, in the House of Representatives, the North had more power than the South because the uh, because the population was growing in in the House. It's based on population, uh, the number of representatives you have. But in the uh, in the Senate, you know, each state has equal representation. In the, the South was desperately trying to maintain equality of power in the Senate. So they, they made a point that every time a, f- a free state joined, there had to be a slave state as well to maintain that balance. In 1818, Congress voted uh, to create what's, what's really the uh, American flag of today with 13 red and white stripes. And they also voted that a new star would be added for each new state on July 4th following that state's admission. Uh, every time, yeah, so every, every July 4th, they'd add a, add a star or maybe more than one star depending on how many states had joined the Union in the previous year. Major problem that we had was Florida, uh, what's now coastal Alabama, Louisiana, uh, and uh, well, in the state of Florida, was a Spanish colony, and it was very weakly governed. You know, the Spanish had this huge empire, and the uh, Seminole Indians were the major Indians in Florida, uh, and and a lot of uh, African-American slaves had escaped south and join the Seminole Indians. They become free in Florida, in the Spanish colony. And uh, the Seminole Indians and these uh, African Americans, uh, uh, African Americans were going on raids into Georgia and making pirate attacks. So this was this was unacceptable, you know, because then they thought, oh well, they would they would cross the border and make a raid and you know steal horses and steal things and then go back into Florida. And they thought, oh, it's it's Spanish territory. You know, they can't they can't catch us. However, the U.S. was fed up with this, and the U.S. Army, led by Andrew Jackson, entered Florida, defeated the Seminole Indians and these uh, free African Americans, destroyed homes, and hanged two Seminole Indian chiefs. Also in 1818, the National Road was opened between Cumberland, Maryland, and Wheeling, West Virginia, 130 miles long, 20 feet wide, a stone surface. They also called it the Cumberland Road. So this was an important step, important uh, contribution to our nation's infrastructure. So by by uh, 1819, there had been negotiations. The U.S. Army was in Florida, and the uh, U.S. had been negotiating to buy Florida, and finally the Spanish agreed uh, under duress, and the U.S. paid $5 million for Florida. And you have to give Andrew Jackson a lot of credit for that because he was the one that went in and he got into some trouble because he exceeded his mandate. He was just supposed to go in and, uh, and um, you know, do a little fighting, maybe try to find the renegades who had been making these raids and leave. And he'd stayed. And then uh, Americans wanted Florida. And uh, so this, this happened in 1819. Florida became a part, became a U.S. territory. Also in 1819, the Savannah was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic, sailed from Savannah, Georgia, to Liverpool, England. This was a big deal because, uh, you know, in the old days you had to have sail power to, to, to cross the ocean, to travel to across the ocean. And, uh, you know, if there's no wind, you weren't going anywhere. And with these steamships, they could travel without any, uh, without any wind. And this was, you know, early in the Industrial Revolution. And they burned uh, coal and then, the, you know, these big... Uh, these things, these wheels would move, and the thing could, the, the ships could move without without sail power. This was a really beginning of the trans, early parts of the early part of the transportation revolution on the ocean. In 1820, the population of the United States was 9.6 million people, still very small compared to today. You know, we have like 300 million today. New York had the state had the most people with 1.3 million, and Pennsylvania was second with 1 million. You know, a big part of that was uh, Philadelphia, this big city. 1820, there was more, more conflict regarding the slavery issue. Missouri was admitted as a slave state. Maine was admitted as a free state. And they voted in Congress to ban slavery north of 36 degrees north latitude. So and John Quincy Adams, the um, uh, James Monroe's Secretary of State, wrote this, quote, I take it for granted that the present question is a mere preamble, a title page to a great tragic volume. 
This was called the Missouri Compromise, and it was we were on our way toward the Civil War because there was growing conflict between North and South. Pe- more and more people in the North were against slavery and thought they were, they were ashamed to live in a country that had slavery. Meanwhile, in the South, uh, people were making money from cotton. Cotton was the big business. Cotton was king, and slavery and slave labor was the labor su- force that was used to cultivate cotton. So they, they didn't want to give up slavery. So the, 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 pro, the, the anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces were growing. During uh, Monroe's presidency, John Quincy Adams was a huge help to him, just as Monroe had been a huge help to Matt, James Madison. And James Madison had been a huge help to Thomas Jefferson, and so forth. The first wedding in the White House took place in 1820. Monroe's daughter, Maria Hester, got married in the White House. So that was a happy time. The 1820 election came, and James Monroe was up for re-election, and he ran, and uh, there was there was no opposition. Nobody ran against him. There were no Republican candidates, and there were no Federalist candidates. The Federalist Party was basically gone. And um, in the Electoral College, Monroe received 231 votes, uh, one short of, of 100%. One vote went to John Quincy Adams, who was embarrassed by, by receiving this vote because he, 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 he didn't run. But one of the presidential electors, one of the guys in the Electoral College, believed that uh, he, he, his reasoning was George Washington was the only president to be unanimously elected twice. And once, and no other president had 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 that happen. He thought, well, this should. He wanted to sort of preserve that honor for George Washington. But basically, Monroe, you know, was was reelected unanimously, aside from this token vote for John Quincy Adams. So he was reelected for a second term. So you can see how popular he was. And really, we only had one party. The Federalist Party was so weak, and the Republican Party. There was no question that he would be the nominee. His vice president was John Tompkins. He was also re-elected. In New York City, there's a Tompkins Square Park named after uh, John Tompkins. Interesting. So he was preparing for his second uh, four-year term, second and last. Also in 1821, the first public high school in the United States opened in Boston, Massachusetts. That year, two of the famous American authors, who still are well-known today, include Washington Irving, and, and James Fenimore Cooper, who are very, very well known. James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote uh, Last of the Mohican, Mohicans. And I believe one of the, one of the characters is uh, the old TV show MASH, Hawkeye Pierce. It was named after a character from the, from the Last of the Mohicans, written by James Fenimore Cooper. And MASH was a popular TV show back in the 70s. 17s. In 1822... The, uh, one of the big empires over in the, well, in the Middle East was the Ottoman Empire. It was weakening. And, well, it was on a long path toward weakness because it was very despotic. You know, it was not a democratic empire, and they had a very corrupt government. And um, there was uh, a movement among Greeks. Greeks were fighting for independence. Now, remember back in, you know, 1822, Americans were very much uh, interested in the ancient Greeks and Romans and really believed in them. You know, they Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, all this ancient stuff from Greece and Rome. So Americans were captivated. They thought, oh, wow, the Greeks are fighting for independence. So private donors in Charleston, South Carolina, donated 50 barrels of dried meat to feed the Greek insurgents against the Ottoman Empire. Lord Byron was an intellectual who actually, a poet from England, who went and died fighting for Greek independence. I have a friend named Byron Spooner, named after uh, Lord Byron, who's He's a Greek-American. Well, it appears we're out of time. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you. I'll see you next time.